tonight I want to reveal to you the relevance of biblical creation, not only to the very foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to the very foundation for the freedoms that Americans hold dear and have enjoyed for more than 200 years. If you've ever wondered what is going on with our country over the past 30 years, I'm going to show you what it is tonight. A lot of folks don't realize it, but in fact, Christians as a whole seem to really be asleep at the wheel. And we're in a world war. We're in the greatest world war in the history of the world. And I'm not talking about a war on terrorism. That's nothing compared to this war. This is a war of world views. And at the foundational level, it is the secular worldview, which is based on millions of years of death and suffering, leading to Darwinian-style evolution and getting God out of the picture, versus the biblical worldview, which is based on, think about this, a perfect creation that was corrupted by man's original sin that separated us from our loving Creator, requiring us to be redeemed with that Creator. And that's the foundation for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that some more in just a moment. But Karl Marx is known as the father of communism. He said that people without a heritage are easily persuaded or defeated. And he said the first battlefield is the rewriting of a country's history. Well, my friends, over the past 30 plus years, America's history, our heritage, has been completely rewritten. It has been stolen from our children and our children's children. Today, kids come out of high school hating America, ashamed to be Americans. While millions of people around the globe risk their lives to get here, we're teaching our kids to be ashamed to be Americans. If we were a terrible, horrible, slave-owning country. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes also. This really, uh, I want to show you tonight that the uh, historical revisionists have been teaching our kids that Christianity had little, if any, role in the founding of America, and that the biblical God has had no role in the successes this country has enjoyed. This really came home to me and my wife Joanna about a year and a half ago. We were speaking at some churches back in the Virginia and Maryland area, and we had a day off, so we went into Washington, D.C., and we toured some of the federal institutions like the Lincoln and the Jefferson and the more, more, uh, Washington Memorial. And what we found etched into stone and inscribed in brass and other precious metals all over federal institutions in Washington, D.C., were biblical verses, praises to our glorious biblical creator, depictions of the Ten Commandments everywhere, and it dawned on us, our heritage has been stolen. Our kids are no longer taught about our Christian heritage. And the Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So I felt led to put together this teaching that I call, If the Foundations Be Destroyed. And I want to show you that America was founded by predominantly Christian men and women on predominantly Christian principles that all men are created equal. And that creation is essential to the freedoms that Americans hold dear because your freedoms don't come from any government. As American citizens, your freedoms come from the fact you're endowed by who? Your creator. We've been teaching the last 50 years of American kids, there's no creator. Hmm. We'll talk about that later, too. And I want to show you that to destroy the United States of America, all you must do is destroy people's faith in biblical creation. Because if there was no creator, you have no creator-given rights. And that means the government can take them away from you. And I'll say this also, if we don't believe and, and worship our creator, we don't deserve any freedoms from them, do we? In fact, this is Jedediah Morris, one of our founding fathers. He said that whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government must fall with them. And my friends, to destroy the pillars of Christianity, all one must do is destroy people's faith in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. 
You see, it's the early chapters of Genesis, specifically 1 and 3, that lay down the whole framework, the foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about it. This is where we're told that God created a perfect universe. There was no death. There was no evil. There was no suffering in that perfect creation. Have you ever had a scoffer or perhaps even a well-meaning seeker say to you, Where's your loving God? We live in a war full of death and disease and car accidents. There's no loving God. Ha ha, you Christians. Where's your loving God? You know where the biblical answer is found? In Genesis 1 and 3. God didn't create a world full of death, evil, and suffering. He created a perfect world, a perfect universe. What happened to it? Well, we're told right there it was Adam's original sin. This is what separated us from our loving Creator. The Bible tells us it was original sin that allowed death and evil to enter God's perfect creation. That's the answer to the scoffers right there. It's our sin that corrupted the creation. Well, this original sin, think about this, separated us from our loving Creator. And this is why we need to be reunited or redeemed with Him. You know where the first promise of a coming Redeemer is found in Scripture? In Genesis 3, verse 15, where we're told the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. By Genesis 3, verse 15, that whole foundation is laid down. In fact, almost the whole rest of Scripture is telling us about God's plan of redemption. So if you can destroy the foundation for why we need redemption, and that's what millions of years in Darwinism do, You've just destroyed any reason for us to need that Redeemer. Oh, and by the way, the seed of the woman, that's, that's a fairly odd comment because the seed comes from the man. By saying seed of the woman, that's also the first promise that our coming Redeemer would be born of a virgin. Amen. All laid down in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And that is why you see Genesis under relentless attack and creation under relentless attack because it sets the foundation for the gospel of that redeeming Savior born of a virgin, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is what millions of years and Darwinian-style evolution are all about. And I used to be a theistic evolutionist. Most folks that compromise God's word with millions of years don't have a clue and that's the reason we try to... What our ministry is doing is evangelizing Christians. Well, I'll speak on a college campus, but you know, I don't go there to argue with the scoffers and the non-believers. Studies say we're losing four out of five Christian kids by the age of 20. I can speak on a college campus and reach dozens of them. But you know who attacks me the most if I speak on a college campus? Any guesses? Christians. The campus pastors... The campus pastors, they'll tell me I'm mean, haughty, arrogant, unloving. And I'll say, what are you talking about? Well, you're telling people that don't believe the Bible, the Bible's true. <laughs> oh, yeah, I haven't spoken to any of you in two years because I get attacked by those guys all the time. And all the kids go to the campus pastors. We've got to have Russ come and talk. And not a single one has ever allowed me to talk to those kids. Now, Darwinists and uh, atheists, they understand this better than Christians. This is the editor of American Atheists. He said, if there was never an original sin, there's no need of salvation. You see, no original sin, no separation. No separation, no need for redemption. And that puts Jesus into the ranks of the unemployed. And I agree with that statement 100%. If there was no original sin separating us from a Creator, why do we need to be redeemed with a Creator that doesn't even exist? That's what evolution and millions of years are about, my friends. The humanistic religious worldview has been taught as if it were science for the past 50 years. And interesting enough, it's based on the sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water that make up the crust of the earth. You know, once again, it depends on your worldview. I look at sedimentary layers laid down by water, and I say, well, wow, praise God, a global flood, a young earth creation. The old earth beliefs are all based on a belief that those sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water form slowly over never seen millions of billions of years of time. 
But for the last 50 years, we've been teaching our kids that those layers form slowly as man evolved all on his own over billions of years of death and suffering. Which means, kids, we don't want to step on your parents' religious toes and beliefs, but science shows there was no creator. There was no original sin separating you from your creator. <coughs> kids, there's no reason for you to be redeemed with your creator. And that's what millions of years of evolution are all about. And that's the reason we as Christians need to start contending for our faith. If America's Christians continue down this road much further, we will lose our God-given rights. The USA is going to fall flat on its face. And the world is going to lose what God had used as his city upon a hill for the first 190 years of our existence. I get a lot of weird emails, believe it or not. Here's one of them. Remember this. This guy is a victim of our rewritten history. He said, your attempt to convince others that Darwinism isn't true is unconstitutional. He said, you're a danger to society and should be put in a mental institution before you take away the freedoms given to us by our forefathers. He's a victim. This is what kids are taught. You've all heard this. Think about it. If you're a Christian, especially one outspoken, you're trying to impose some theocracy on Americans and take away our freedoms. And you hear that all the time, right? Our freedoms come from our biblical creator. If you're standing up for Jesus Christ, you're standing up for America's freedoms. And that's the reason you're going to come under assault. So I thought, hey, let's take a look at the fingerprint of God upon the history of the United States of America, and then let's see where we've gone with it. Well, believe it or not, in the early 1700s, before we officially became the United States, the pilgrim and the Puritan zeal for God had pretty much disappeared in this land. In fact, the people of the country and even the church itself had pretty much turned its back on the biblical God. And they weren't preaching Jesus Christ died for your sins. Well, at this point in time, here's one thing very important to understand. Those folks held to a creation-based worldview. In other words, they understood a perfect creation corrupted by sin that had separated them from their loving Creator. They still understood the need for redemption with that Creator. But when the Apostle Paul preached to people that understood that creation foundation, he just immediately began preaching Jesus Christ as that redeeming Savior who died on a cross to reunite you with your loving Creator. He's the Messiah you've been waiting for. He just immediately preached Christ crucified and reaped a bountiful harvest of saved souls. Well, God sent over some British evangelists who teamed up with a handful of God-honoring pastors, and they couldn't preach in churches because most of them slammed the door in their face. So they went out in open fields and meadows and town squares and preached, Jesus Christ died for you, and God poured forth His blessing, and the crowds grew to the thousands. And we had the first great awakening, a great Christian revival, as this nation and all 13 colonies soon united as one nation under God. And they demanded and they won back their God-given rights from the British. In fact, the Liberty Bell is inscribed with Leviticus 25.10 that reads, Pro Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And they took on the world's superpower with a ragtag army and won the freedoms we enjoy today. Jesus Christ told us, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be likened unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains ascended and the floods came and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. My friends, that rock is the uncompromised word of God, word for word and cover to cover. And this nation was founded upon that rock. In fact, Founding Father Benjamin Rush, our first Surgeon General, stated that it excuse me, the only foundation for a republic is to be laid in religion. And Christianity is the only true and perfect religion. In fact, 93% of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Christians. 95% of the authors of the U.S. Constitution were Christians. We were founded 
upon the rock. In fact, the very declaration of independence refers to the biblical God as our supreme judge, our creator, nature's lawmaker, and our divine protector, all right there in the declaration of independence. In fact, Patrick Henry stated that this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God created man in his own image, male and female. One of the things kids are taught today in school is that we're a, we were and our founding fathers were horrible, terrible, slave-owning people. Well, men, several of them did own slaves. There's no doubt about that. But you need to realize something. This country was founded in a world full of slavery. And you couldn't get the 13 colonies to unite and outlaw slavery. It would not have happened. But in the very declaration, our founding fathers planted the seeds to get rid of slavery by stating that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That is a biblical belief. And that biblical belief is in our declaration that planted the seeds to get rid of slavery. Here's another email I got from yet another victim. He says, it's a shame you don't know our history, and you won't get away with your Christian lies. The Constitution is a secular document. That's what kids are taught today, but let's see what the facts might say. Believe it or not, right after the Revolutionary War, the states failed to remain united. They began squabbling over trade rights and tariffs and such. So in 1787, a Constitutional Convention was convened in Philadelphia. Now, the two main reference sources for the Constitution, cited by the authors of the Constitution themselves, were number one, the King James Bible, and number two, writings by Sir William Blackstone, whose findings were based on the Ten Commandments of God. In fact, at the Constitutional Convention, Ben Franklin proposed every session of Congress should begin with a prayer to the biblical God. And since 1787, every single session of Congress has begun with a prayer to the biblical God. Until last year. When they opened up with a prayer to the false God of Islam. Now George Washington is known as the father of our nation. He was a commander of the Continental Army and our first president. He ended his oath to the presidency by saying, So help me God, as he bent down to kiss the Bible. Our second president was John Adams. This founding father stated our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Which probably answers a lot of the issues we see before us today. Our third president was Thomas Jefferson. He was the principal author of the Declaration, which continually for, refers back to the biblical God. Now, our history today teaches he was a Christian skeptic or a deist. However, as president, he attended Christian church services held in both the uh, U.S. Capitol building and in the Supreme Court buildings. He wrote the education plan for D.C. schools using the King James Bible as the primary reading book. It's clear he wanted this nation founded on Christian principles. In fact, Jefferson wrote to those who said he was a Christian skeptic, stating that his beliefs were the result of a life of inquiry and reflection, and much different from the anti-Christian system imputed to him by those who knew nothing about his opinions. Our fourth president was James Madison. James Madison is known as the principal author of the First Amendment's religion clause. So if anyone would know about a separation of church and state, this would be the man. As president, he attended Christian church services held in the U.S. Capitol building, and he promoted hiring pastors for both the House and the Senate, using federal funds to pay for their salaries. But what about that separation of church and state that's found in the First Amendment. Nowhere in the U.S. Constitution is such a phrase mentioned. 
In fact, the First Amendment begins, Congress shall make no law respecting the an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This clearly prohibits the government from sponsoring an official government religion. Like, well, as an example, maybe spending billions of taxpayer dollars to teach secular humanism, which is based on naturalism, which is based on millions of years leading to Darwinism. It's being taught as science today. It's not science. It's an anti-science religious belief. And this leaves religious activities to the discretion of the people of each individual state to decide upon for themselves. In other words, the federal government isn't, isn't supposed to have a say in the matter whatsoever. This was meant to protect religious activities, not to undermine our Christian-based freedoms. In fact, Madison stated that we have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of the government, but upon the capacity of each of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. It's clear that the Founding Fathers intended to keep the federal government out of the church while keeping Christian principles in the government. Why? So the government would not become corrupted, which probably addresses some of the issues we see today also. I won't go into that either right now. But in the late 1700s, when the ink had hardly dried on the Constitution, believe it or not, Europe's age of reason had invaded the United States. This was a group of man-made philosophies which tried to answer life's questions and get God out of the picture. And believe it or not, the people of the United States and the church itself once again turned its back on the true biblical God. But here's something very important to understand. They still held to that creation-based foundation. They still understood a perfect creation corrupted by man's sin that had separated them from their loving creator. They still understood the need for redemption. In fact, many Christian schools like Yale and Harvard have become secular, just like many of today's Christian schools have become. But in 1795, Yale appointed Timothy Dwight as their new president, and he began urging seniors to return to serving God with their lives. One of those seniors was Lyman Beecher, who became a pastor. And in the 1820s, Pastor Lyman Beecher began preaching, Christ died for your sins. Most churches, again, slammed the door in his face, so he went out in the public squares and fields and began preaching, Christ died for you. God poured forth his blessing yet again, and the crowds grew to the thousands. And we had the second great awakening in this nation as we united again as one nation under God. The second great awakening was underway. It was in 1835 that Alexis de Tocqueville visited here from France, and he wrote that Americans combine the notions of Christianity and liberty so intimately in their minds that it's impossible to make them conceive one without the other. In 1835, Americans couldn't even conceive having liberty without it being based on Christian principles. In 1848, the cornerstone of the Washington Memorial was laid down. Inside it were placed copies of the Constitution, the Declaration, and the King James Bible. Christian references are found engraved throughout that stone structure. The Capitol building was dedicated in 1858. Christian engravings are found throughout the stone walls, such as America, God shed His grace on thee, and in God we trust. If you enter the rotunda, you'll find 18 foot wide paintings ringing the rotunda. Three out of four have Christian based themes, like Pocahontas being baptized. To enter the main chamber, you pass through a room that has marble reliefs of 22 of the world's history's greatest lawmakers. There will be 11 on your left and 11 on your right. They're all facing as if they're going in also, so you only see the sides of their faces. Over the main door, the one person they're all facing is facing back to you. You see his entire face? That person is Moses. 
In fact, stained glass in the Capitol Building's chapel depict George Washington kneeling to pray under a sign that states, This nation under God. It was the Second Great Awakening that led the uh, crusade to finally abolish slavery in this nation. In fact, the Battle Hymn of the Republic included the words, As Christ died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. And the great Christian heritage that this country has that has been stolen from our children is that though we were founded in a world full of slavery, 600,000 Americans died in the war to free the slaves. That's the great heritage we should be teaching our kids. Abraham Lincoln said the Bible is the best gift God has given to man. We could not know right from wrong without it. Once again, shedding light on the problems we have today. Ulysses S. Grant was the commander.